Welcome to the NeuroStronger podcast, a podcast aimed to connect, inform, and inspire neurologically disabled children and their families with the latest research. This is Vishnu Kagalanu, and in this episode, we will focus on genetic therapies for neurodevelopmental disorders like autism, a neurological disorder that causes limited speech and restricted social communication skills. I want to welcome Dr. Jonathan Sabat, Professor of Psychiatry and and Cellular and Molecular Medicine at the UCSD School of Medicine and Director of the Sabat Lab. Dr. Sabat conducts whole genome analysis of neurodevelopmental disorders and researches genetic therapies. Dr. Sabat is also chair of the CNV analysis group for the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, as well as co-chair of the Genotyping Working Group of the Genes2 Mental Health uh, Network. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Sabat. Thank you, Vishnu. Good to be here. So, Dr. Sabat, you're among the leading experts who have researched genetic risk factors of autism using third-generation sequencing technologies in depth. Could you please explain these genetic factors, like CNVs, behind autism and how they impact the nervous system of children? So, um, I mean, even before all of the success that we and others had in the, you know, early to mid 2000s finding autism genes even before we'd found a single autism gene it was already pretty clear that there was a strong genetic basis because in twin studies you could see that if you had an identical twin who met criteria for autism the chances are that the chances that you had uh, met criteria for autism was 70 to 90 percent um, it was also significantly increased for siblings so the fact that there was strong genetic drivers of autism. This this was known long before we had ever found the first genes. Um, and then, of course, in order to find the genes, all we needed was the right technologies. And that uh, first came about in the early 2000s. Around 2005, Jim Simons funded a study by Mike Wiggler and me at Cold Spring Harbor Lab, where we published the first study of de novo mutation in autism, where we showed that rare mutations in the genome that impact genes were significantly associated with with autism, where a new de novo mutation that wasn't inherited from mom or dad were present at more than five times more frequently in cases compared to their unaffected siblings. And those th- that was like the very first big break. Um, and ultimately, that became the standard approach for discovery of autism genes. So we now have over a hundred autism susceptibility genes identified, and those were uh, almost exclusively found from analysis of de novo mutations in traits. So, so ultimately it's been, it's been a pretty much a straight line from, uh, from kind of the early rare variant findings to now having a very pretty broad understanding of the types of genes that influence neurodevelopment and predispose to um, to ASD. Hundred percent, and just like transitioning like a little bit more into like your work and like your specialization specifically, um, you and your team at the UCSD Sabat Lab uh, combine technology driven genomic discovery and well powered clinical and genomic studies. Can you just tell us a little bit more about like your work and what inspired you to get involved in this really specific specialization? Um. I, I, you know, it, it's a, it's always a mixture of interest and serendipity, right? Um, I have to say, uh, when we when we first got a hold of the technology for finding mutations genome wide, it was kind of obvious that we should start looking at places where where we know that there are chromosome abnormalities and other types of genetic factors that contribute to disease. And that was in Down syndrome, 22Q deletion syndrome, places where there were neurodevelopmental disorders in children was an obvious place to start. Um, Of course, we, it was, it was kind of courageous to to make the leap beyond intellectual disability and go into a more complex disorder like autism. And uh, one of the uh, driving factors that, that gave us a little bit of extra incentive was the fact that Jim Simons, who founded the Simons Foundation, was looking around for some of the very first uh, autism research studies to fund. And we were just very fortunate 
to have uh, contact with Jim Simons and to be one of the first research studies in autism the Simon, that Jim Simons and Marilyn Simons funded. So, that, so ultimately, it was it was a combination of inspiration and serendipity <laughs> that moved us quick that moved us quickly in the direction of complex psychiatric traits as opposed to just you know neurodevelopmental disorders and intellectual disability. Awesome. And yeah, just getting into like now a little bit more about like your research in this area. Um, you once mentioned that game-changing sequencing technologies and the creation of large um, genomic data sets have turned autism from the most misunderstood disorder to the most understood in the post-genomic era. Can you just explain a little bit more about some of the awesome research that you're doing in this area to our, our audience? Well, it's not, it's not me specifically, exclusively. Uh, there's, there's now, uh, there's now a, a broad range of research labs that are doing genomic analysis of autism as well as basic neuroscience and, and translational neuroscience. Um, and I'm fortunate to be able to collaborate with, with people from all of those different areas. And so uh, I would say that what I, what I really find most rewarding now is, is the ability to bring neuroscientists, geneticists, and clinical psychologists and psychiatrists together to work on a problem. And what allows that to happen is the genes, right? Uh, before, before we had genes, uh, you, had, you had clinical psychology and psychiatry working on one, one, in one realm, and you had basic neuroscience working on another you know, level, and there wasn't a link. There was nothing that linked the basic neuroscience to the clinical psychiatry. But once you had clear gene mutations that had big effects in neuronal cells, in human cell culture, had big effects in mice, and had big effects in the human to where you could actually characterize clinical features associated with that gene, the fact that it was the genes that allow you to link together uh, the clinical neuroscience and the uh, and the uh, basic neuroscience. Yeah, um, all that sounds. And that's that's actually what we and that's that's what we're really focusing on yeah. a lot right now. So I'm I'm the I'm the director of a new center that was just funded by the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, um, and the goal of this center is to use genetics um, and deep clinical characterization of gene mutations in patients and deep uh, molecular and cellular characterization of the same mutations in the lab. Awesome. And I actually had the um, pleasure of going through one of your papers, um, Getting to the Core of Autism. And it really is a fascinating read. Um, one line in the end, the conclusion really stood out to me. It said that bridging the gap between genes, neurodevelopmental, uh, and cognitive function will likely require the adoption of big data approaches in the field of translational neuroscience and clinical psychiatry. And I thought that was so interesting, like making um, like precision psychiatric medicine. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't finish the quote. Making precision psychiatric medicine a reality is a task for the next decade. Do you think that the latest deep learning architectures with transformer models will make these gene therapies discoveries um, possible? And like, what do you think the role of big data will be in the future? So obviously the, the okay, so, so, so the genetics of autism, if it were just a handful of genes, um, big data might still be useful, uh, but it might not be a requirement. But the reality is there are hundreds of autism susceptibility genes. And these gene mutations are, you know, when and we know the functions of a lot of these gene mutations, but when you look at them, they are incredibly diverse. There's not one single pathway that contributes to autism. There's not one single, there's not even one type of neuron or one particular region of the brain or, uh, or one type of neurotransmission at the synapse. That is not the case, right? There's, there's a really wide variety. They're all genes that are expressed during fetal brain development. So if there's one thing that they, they, if there's one commonality that we can clearly see among autism genes is that they play roles in the developing brain and they play roles in regulating fetal brain development. That much we know, but that's, a, that's, that's, that's not a very clear pathway, right? So we have to go, we have to go much deeper in understanding what are the pathways. Also, we have to recognize the fact that there may be specific processes and pathways that 
that correlate very distinctly with with uh, with certain neuropathologies and certain behaviors. But that will just be a slice of autism. That's not going to be all of autism. There'll be a slice of autism that has as it's has a specific molecular and cellular basis and other phenotypic correlates that relate to that molecular cellular basis. Um, so that so just taking that as the broad overview, now that you look at it with all of the genes and the diversity of pathways and gene networks that are involved, that you have no choice but to make the translational, clinical, and basic neuroscience studies a data science. It is a data science problem to actually figure out what are the clusters of genes that are driving particular processes and what are the phenotypic correlates at the co neurocognitive and psychiatric level that that also are characteristics of those same clusters of genes. Right? And then, of course, we know that one gene or even a small cluster of genes is never sufficient to cause autism. Autism is not a monogenic trait. Autism is a complex neurocognitive behavioral condition, right? And, and it's never a single gene. So uh, once you have that figured out, then you also have to understand what other secondary genetic and environmental factors are modifying that process or 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 a completely different process and which which explain other variability in clinical outcome, right? And then by taking those taking taking the intersection of all of those things, you know, where is autism in all of that? <laughs> right? Given factor A and factor B and factor C, and how they how they you know co vary with each other, and now take everyone who actually meets criteria for autism inside of that phenotypic space. Where does autism sit at the intersection of all of these things? I think that's and, and I think that's sort of really that's that's the problem, and it's only gonna it's only gonna become uh, you know solvable when we have big data on the molecular and cellular functions of all of these genes and we have the same thing with the clinical with the clinical phenotype neurocognitive and psychiatric data um, and and being able to integrate those two things that's that's what's going to give us the convergence that we're looking for the convergence in cellular molecular function and convergence in in uh in clinical outcomes and finally for our last question dr sabat just zooming in a little bit more on your lab um, your lab is developing antisense oligonucleotide, which is ASO, therapies for treating haploinsufficiency that causes these debilitating diseases. Can you just tell us a little bit more about the gene therapies that you've been, you and um, clinics around the world have been developing and the expected impact on treating autism? Sure. Uh, let me let me back up and talk a little bit more basics about what gene therapies even mean. Totally. In the context of autism. So we, we talked about how autism is not a monogenic trait. Autism is a spectrum. And uh, a single gene doesn't explain everything about the autism. So a single gene may have very specific cellular and molecular processes that it's regulating and may have a, a, a segment of the a segment of the spectrum may be attributable to that gene, right? So I, I view a genetic therapy is not unlike a therapy for um, cholesterol, hypertension, right? You, you, there, there's, a, there's a segment of the clinical outcome that's influenced by a pathway and by targeting that pathway, either, either pharmacologically or genetically, you may be able to, uh, to have, you may be able to improve outcomes for people. You may be able to improve their functions uh, in the in the uh, on in daily life, um, and that's the goal of genetic therapies. I think I think there's a lot of I think there's a lot of misconceptions around genetic therapies that it's that it's about editing, it's about editing babies, right? And that's that's not what it's about, right? ASOs, as I mentioned, are not are not edits. Those are those are just drugs, right? They're just genetic drugs. They, you you give the drug to someone, and they can they can take the drug, or they can stop taking the drug. Um, and uh, and wash it out, and and it's not it's not you're not editing the baby's genome. Um, but anyway, just to give you a basic sense of what we're focused on, uh, our 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 research to date 
has really been focused on developing high throughput screens for these kinds of ASOs because um, the biggest challenge is that if you put all if, if you if you pick your favorite gene and say okay I want to make it I want to make a drug for this gene you're going to pour a, an enormous amount of effort into that and and you don't even know if it's really a druggable target to begin with right? you don't really know if your if your ASO is going to have the effect that you want it to have um, and so the approach that we've decided to take is to really go transcriptome wide and to start um, you know developing what, what we're using are CRISPR based CRISPR based technologies which mimic the effect of ASOs um, and be able to apply them high in a fairly transcriptome wide manner um, against a wide range of targets. And so even before you so rather than choose the gene and say, I'm gonna try my darndest to, to make a drug for this, figure out what what transcripts are actually druggable in the first place, right? Through transcript on widescreens. So so uh so yeah, our we have a we have a Simons Foundation funded project which is developing the transcript on widescreens. Um and they're they're really focused on uh ASOs are really good at knocking genes down. Um, those that's that's pretty easy to do. Um, it's much harder to increase the expression of a gene, and that's what we're actually trying to do with the ASOs that we're working on. So we have a cup where there's a couple of different uh, approaches that do work to to upregulate genes. Hopefully, our our transcriptome wide screens will uh, will identify some targets for us. Yeah, Dr. Seva, um, your research work in whole genome analysis of these disorders and development development of therapeutic strategies for neurodevelopmental conditions is both just really cool and also um, giving hope to a lot of these children who have these conditions. Thank you so much for joining us today on the NeuroStronger podcast and for making this interview possible. And thank you to our audience for helping us come up with these questions and for tuning in today. Thanks, Vishnu. It was, uh, it was good talking with you.